In this video on gene expression regulation or transcription regulation, you will learn everything you need to know about black operon, which is a regulatory system in bacteria. And we will discuss some simple and complex things on how the lac operon activity and expression is regulated in the presence of glucose and lactose or their combination. First, let's simply define an operon. It is a bacterial DNA unit, a transcriptional unit specifically, which is regulated as a single unit. In lac operon, this single unit controls the lactose metabolism. Just a quick note on bacterial gene expression, we have seen from the previous transcription and translation videos that transcription starts on the DNA, and as soon as the RNA is made, ribosomes can immediately start the process of translation. And this is possible because there is no nucleus or compartment within bacteria. So translation occurs co-transcriptionally, which means that gene expression is only limited by the transcription rate. And transcription therefore becomes the major process to regulate in bacteria. Now, it is obvious to think that in a normal state, when gene expression is not required, the expression of that gene is turned off. And this is called negative regulation. And this suggests that the gene expression must be induced to turn the gene on when required. This is exactly how lac operon works. And since it is induced to get turned on, we also refer to lac operon as an inducible operon. If things are unclear at the moment, don't worry, we will discuss all this terminology on gene expression being on, off, and inducible in this particular video. To understand lac operon, we must start by looking at the components and the structure at the DNA level first, that encodes and makes up the lac operon. In lac operon, there are three major genes, which are lac A, Y, and lac Z. Collectively, they are referred to as LAC-ZYA. These are sometimes also called structural genes. As we will see later, these three genes are involved in the lactose metabolism, so it is perhaps better to think of them as metabolic genes. Now, immediately before LAC-Z, or partially overlapping the LAC-Z, is a DNA sequence known as the operator, and we will refer to it as OLAC. And this OLAC has the transcriptional start site, that is this arrowhead. And before the operator sequence, we have the promoter region, that is PLAC. An important note about this promoter is that it is a very weak promoter. Upstream of the PLAC is a cap binding sequence, which will be important later. So don't think about it too much for now. And upstream of this cap binding site is a gene that encodes the repressor of LAC operon, known as LAC I. And this LAC I has its own promoter, PI. And this promoter is also a very weak promoter. Again, we'll come back to the significance of weak promoters in lac operon in a short while. All right, one subtle thing here is that OLAC is the major operator sequence, but there are two more operator sequences which are weak because they deviate a bit from the consensus. The one upstream is present at the end of the lac I, and we will call it OWU for operator weak upstream. And the one downstream is present in the lac Z, and we will call it OWD, for operator weak downstream. And if you're interested, the length of this entire section of the DNA is around 6,000 base pairs. Now, one thing to notice here is that there are three metabolic genes, but they have one common promoter, which is why in our definition we said that the regulation occurs as one single unit. So one promoter and three genes. To expand on this idea, you have one promoter that will eventually make one single mRNA. But this mRNA will have three genes, so intuitively, you will have these three genes, Z, Y, and A, on the same mRNA. And this mRNA is called LAC ZYA mRNA. And these types of mRNA where you have multiple protein coding genes in one mRNA are called polycystronic mRNAs where one cistron represents one coding gene. Let's now take a look at these three genes. Since we said that these three genes are involved in lactose metabolism, or lactose breakdown, these genes are catabolic genes. The first one, LAC-Z, encodes for a beta-galactosidase, which means that it codes for an enzyme that breaks down or metabolizes complex carbohydrates, specifically the beta-galactosides. This gene is the largest of these three genes, and the enzyme weighs around 500 kilodaltons. In context of lac operon, it breaks down lactose into galactose and glucose. 
it has one more function, which is that it converts lactose into allolactose via its trans-glycosylation activity. The second gene, LACY, encodes for the beta-galactoside permease, which is a membrane-bound transport protein, and this protein weighs around 30 kilodaltons. In the context of LAC operon, it transports the beta-galactoside, which here is the lactose, into the cell from the outside. The third gene is LAC-A, which is not as important as LAC-Z and Y, but it encodes for beta-galactoside transacetylase, which transfers acetyl-CoA to beta-galactosides. We will talk more about this one at the end. For the sake of lactose metabolism, you don't actually need LAC-A. So these three are the structural or metabolic genes. Now notice that there is a the LAC-I gene, which encodes for the repressor. So let's just lay out the introduction of LAC-I as well. In LAC-I, the I stands for inducible, and this gene encodes for the repressor protein which represses the LAC-ZYA expression. We will soon see what makes this LAC-I inducible and how the repressor actually works. The LAC-I produces a monomeric protein which is around 40 kilodaltons, and four of these monomers come together to form a tetramer. And it is this tetramer which is a functional repressor. And this tetrameric repressor has the potential to bind the operator DNA sequence. The repressor protein is also inhibited by inducer molecules. In LAC operon, the inducer molecule is the allolactose, the same molecule which results from the lactose. Let's explore this LAC I a bit more. This LAC I is a fairly simple transcriptional unit with a weak promoter, which is not regulated, so it's always on. And this promoter drives the expression of LAC-I and makes the mRNA. And ribosomes can translate this mRNA into a monomeric protein. And as we said, four of these monomers form the active tetramer. But because this promoter is weak, only few repressor mRNAs are produced, which suggests that few repressor proteins are produced. There is another layer of information and to understand this, we have to take a look at the 5' prime end of the mRNA. The repressor mRNA has a short leader before the start codon. And this leader has a weak consensus, schein delgarno sequence, which means that even the translation initiation from this mRNA is not very efficient, which means that even fewer repressor proteins can be synthesized. So this combination of weak translation and few repressor mRNAs to begin with keeps the repressor concentration in a cell very low. Great, now let's explore this chunk of DNA here, which is much more interesting with a lot of components. Here, we've got the upstream operator at the end of LAC-I, followed by the cap binding site, and then comes the promoter of LAC-ZYA, which by the way has a negative 35 and a negative 10 element. I also have a separate video that explains the promoter structure in prokaryotes, so you can watch that if you're curious. And following this, you have the operator sequence. And following that, you have the LAC-Z, which also contains a weak operator sequence. This representation is not to scale. So for an intuitive idea of the scale, the operators are 20 bases in length, the cap binding is also 20 bases in length, and the promoter is around 50 base pairs in length. And the distance from the main operator to the downstream operator is 400 bases quite a big distance relative to the distance between the main operator and the upstream operator, which is only 100 bases. And this information will be very useful soon when we discuss repressor bindings. And just to clarify, this operator is the region that contains the binding site for the repressor. And this repressor, as we said, is low in concentration, but to put it in numbers, at steady state levels, only around 10 active tetrameric proteins are present in the cell. Alright, now that we have our basics covered, let's try to understand the output or the activity of LAC operon, given some input. We will start by looking at the resting state, which is when there is no lactose available in the environment for the cell to break down. The expectation is that the LAC operon will be turned off. So this is fairly simple, you do not need the enzymes that break down lactose if lactose is not available. I will start out by simply drawing out the operon, and while I finish sketching and labeling the operon, you should probably double check that you have subscribed to this channel and have hit the bell icon for notifications when a new video comes out. 
All right, so we have already said that in this operon, the promoter of the repressor is not regulated, which means that the RNA polymerase is free to bind to this promoter and start transcription, and this will make the repressor mRNA that gets translated into a monomeric protein. This repressor monomer has a DNA binding domain, which binds the DNA, and then two core subdomains, and it has a tail which helps in the oligomerization of a monomer. For simplicity, I will represent the core subdomains as one single unit for easy visualization. Alright, four monomers form a tetramer, and this association of monomers is due to the oligomerization domain. And if we sketch out the tetramer, it'll look something like this, where the DNA binding domains are facing outwards. And this is the active form of repressor, which is a transacting protein. And it has this DNA binding domain which has the affinity towards the operator sequence. So this active repressor goes and binds the operator sequence. To understand how this binding works, let's zoom into the operators, which as we have said before are 20 bases in length. The operator sequence essentially is an inverted repeat, which contains 10 bases that face each other. This is also called the dyad symmetry of the operator. Just a cautionary note on these repeats that they're not perfect repeats in a sequence composition. So the DNA binding domain of the repressor binds at these inverted repeats, and in technical terms, the helix in the DNA binding domain reaches out into the major groove of the repeat sequence. And now, when the RNA polymerase binds at the promoter, it cannot proceed further because the repressor prevents it from moving forward. So the RNA polymerase cannot start transcription. And as a result, the lax ZYA is not expressed. But it's not as simple as this sounds. Actually, the binding of the repressor to the main operator is not super strong. And therefore, a strong repression in the lax ZYA expression requires that the weak operators at the upstream and downstream positions take part in the binding with the repressor. Again, just to make things a bit quantitative, in the absence of upstream and downstream operators, the repression is only about two to four fold, which is fine, but in contrast, when the upstream and downstream operators also engage in the repressor binding, the repression of lax ZYA expression is more than 50 fold. That is a big, big difference. So how does this work then? Notice that there are two DNA binding domains, and these are bound to the inverted repeats on the major operator, but two of them are not bound to any of them which means that they can still bind to operators at these downstream and upstream position. Let's get a bit more concrete and visualize the binding of the repressor to these operators. And here I am sketching out the binding of repressor at the major operator and at the upstream operator. And the striking thing here to observe is that the binding of repressor to these inverted repeats causes a 45 degree bend in the DNA. In this configuration, the RNA polymerase can still bind to the promoter, but because of this looped repressor and operator structure, the movement of RNA polymerase is blocked. And if you recall what we said, the distance between the upstream operator and the major operator is only 100 bases. So the repressor binding between the upstream and the OLAC operator is more frequent relative to the downstream operator and the major operator, because the distance in that case is four times longer. And of course, to complete this picture, we can also sketch out the other possibility, which is that the major operator can also bind to the downstream operator. And that will look something like this. And these two states establish the equilibrium of repressor binding. But since the distance here is 400 bases, the second configuration is less frequent. Okay, now let's focus on a subtle misconception that people often overlook. Say there is a bacteria floating around and it suddenly encounters lactose in the environment. But in its resting state, when the lactose was not present, the lax ZYA is not expressed, as we just discussed. And the question then becomes, if lax ZYA is not expressed, because we have established that the repressor blocks the RNA polymerase, then how is lac operon even activated? How does lactose even get into the cell? You can pause this video and think about it. The answer is that the lac operon is always active at a basal level. Very low levels of lac ZYA RNA are always produced. 
The repressor binding is highly dynamic, so there are small windows when paused polymerase has a chance to slip past and transcribe the LAXEYA mRNA. This low level of expression is like 0.1% of the levels when compared to the activated lacoperon state. So we have established that when there is no lactose, the repressor is active and it binds the operator, and there are two possible ways that it can do that, and this stalls the polymerase, which prevents the transcription. But keep in mind, there is always some basal level of transcription occurring in the cell. And this completes the scenario where if you have no lactose, the operon is off. And this brings us to the next important scenario, which involves the presence of lactose. And now you would expect that the lac operon will be turned on. We have seen that lac operon must have some basal level expression for the operon to be activated. And this means that this bacteria, when it's swimming around and it encounters the lactose, it must have some membrane proteins expressed so that it can import the lactose into the cell. If we zoom into the cell membrane, we will find LACY, which is this membrane-bound protein called permease, and LACY is expressed at a basal level. So this permease allows the lactose from the outside of the cell to be transported into the bacteria. When the lactose is inside, the basal level expression of LACZ, which makes the beta-galactosidase enzyme, converts the lactose into allolactose, because we said in the beginning that has the trans-glycosylation activity. And this allolactose is the crucial molecule. It can bind the repressor molecule, and this molecule is called the inducer. And it binds at the junction of the core subdomains of the monomer. And this binding induces a conformational change in the active repressor and makes it inactive. And now we can draw the operator and repressor binding scenario again, where normally an active repressor binds the operator and stalls the polymerase, and this binding of repressor is of course mediated by the upstream and downstream operators, but when the allolactose binds to the repressor, it causes the repressor to dissociate away from the operator sequence. This means that the stalled polymerase, which is already sitting at the promoter, wastes no time and moves along the DNA and makes the ZYA RNA. And this LACZ in this mRNA makes the galactosidase enzyme, LACY makes the permease, LACA makes the transacetylase. And this LACZ can break down lactose into galactose and glucose. And this permease, which was originally at this basal level, also goes up in expression. And as a result, its concentration on the cell membrane also goes up which means more lactose is transported into the cells, which means that more inducer molecules, the allolactose, can be produced. Remember, we said that only 10 repressor molecules are present in the cells at all times? Well, when the inducer concentration goes up, all those repressor quickly get inactivated. And therefore, as a result, the lac ZYA expression keeps increasing until saturation as long as the lactose is available. Now, here's another subtle difference in understanding that you may not have noticed. People tend to think that the inducer-bound repressor cannot bind DNA. And this is a common misconception. Repressor doesn't just free float in the cell after being inactivated. In reality, the binding of inducer does cause the repressor to dissociate away from the operator. But the proper way to think about this is that the inducer binding changes the affinity of the repressor such that it can no longer recognize the operator sequence specifically. So it starts binding at random places. And the bacterial genome is around 4 megabases. And this operator is only 20 bases long, 60 if you account for all three operators. So there's a lot of free real estate for the repressor to go and bind. All right. So out of these products, the glucose is directly used for energy through the process of glycolysis, which you may have heard in biochemistry. And now we've seen that if lactose is present, the LACZY is induced to be turned on, but there's a small catch. Notice how glucose is directly used for energy. So what if glucose was directly present? In such a case, the glucose would be preferred. And this is a perfect segue to the next scenario where, say, glucose, the preferred substrate, is present, and some lactose, which is not the preferred sugar, may or may not be present. Again, lactose is not preferred over glucose because lactose is a complex sugar, and it requires breaking down versus glucose, which is a simple sugar, and that can be directly used. 
Once again, we pivot ourselves with the lag i, where the unregulated promoter makes the repressor, and the repressor is active by default and binds the operator. But if allolactose is present, the repressor is inactivated. And now let's expand on the case where glucose is absent, but lactose is present. This is the same scenario that we saw just a few minutes ago. But now we'll expand with some more detail that'll help you understand the role of cap binding site in the lac operon activation. So when lactose is present, but glucose is absent, the RNA polymerase binds at the promoter, but the repressor is inactive, which means that the polymerase moves and makes the lac ZYA RNA. But remember we said in the beginning that this promoter is pretty weak. This means that even though RNA polymerase transcribes the mRNA, the amount of mRNA and thereby the amount of proteins of ZYA are not very high. So the polymerase requires some extra help if it wants to further increase the lac ZYA expression. This activation or extra help comes from a protein called CAP, which stands for Catabolite Activator Protein. Sometimes it's also called CRP, which stands for Cyclic AMP Receptor Protein. I like CRP better than CAP because it is quite descriptive. And the gene encoding CRP is located outside of lac operon at some other location in the genome, which is regulated independently. And CRP, for your information, is a positive regulator of the lac operon. This protein is functional as a dimer. For your reference, the lac I repressor is a tetramer. Now, to understand how CRP works in this lac operon, we have to dissect the weak promoter here. This promoter has the negative 35 and the negative 10 elements. And RNA polymerase hollow enzyme with its sigma factors binds at the negative 35 and the negative 10 element. But this is usually not very strong. If you recall the video on transcription initiation in prokaryotes, we discussed that the C terminal domain of the alpha subunit contacts the upstream promoter elements. Upstream of the promoter in the lac operon is the cap binding site where the dimeric cap protein can bind. And its binding causes a 130 degree bend in the DNA, which allows cap to interact with the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase. And this is the interaction that causes the RNA polymerase to go insane and the lac ZYA expression shoots up. Now let's add some details to the CRP function. Recall that cap or CRP, as the name suggests, is a cyclic AMP receptor protein which means that the active form of CRP carries a CAMP molecule with it. Let's get concrete on this idea. The CRP dimer, which is not bound by CMP, is inactive and cannot specifically bind the cap binding region. So only when the CAMP binds, the CRP molecule is active. To fill in some gaps in this process, the CAMP molecule is made from ATP. This reaction from ATP to CAMP is catalyzed by an enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. And this enzyme is active when there is no glucose. This means that the CRP protein is active when there is no glucose because CAMP can be produced. In the other situation, when there is high glucose concentration, this cyclase is inactivated because glucose molecules bind to the active form of the enzyme and make it non-functional. And if this enzyme is inactive, the ATP to CAMP reaction cannot occur. And if CAMP cannot be produced, the active CRP molecule cannot be produced. Now let's formalize this concept involving glucose. When there is glucose present alongside lactose, the CAP cannot bind the cap binding sequence. But because lactose is present, the repressor will be inactivated. So the repressor cannot bind the operator which means that the RNA polymerase is free to transcribe lac ZYA. But the lack of cap protein at the binding site prevents a strong activation of the RNA polymerase, which means that the expression of lac ZYA is not very high. Now, what if there was no lactose and only glucose? Well, in the absence of lactose, the repressor cannot be inactivated, so it goes and binds to the operator. And since we have glucose, the cyclase enzyme will be inactivated, which means that the CAMP production is blocked, and as a result, the CRP cannot be activated, and all these things combined, the RNA polymerase just fails to move ahead. So you get a strong repression of the lac ZYA expression. Great, now let's summarize all the scenarios of the lac operon in a bigger picture. When there is no lactose and no glucose around, a basal level of lac Y is made, 
and it stays on the cell membrane. Given the lack of glucose, the activated CRP can bind to the cap binding sequence. But since there is no lactose, the repressor will remain active as well and bind to the operator. So the transcription from LAC operon remains off. The caveat here is that the LAC operon is in its basal level state, which means that the expression of LAC ZYA is never zero. The situation of no lactose, no glucose is almost the same as having no lactose but only glucose. In the no lactose, no glucose condition, the basal level expression of LAC ZYA is influenced by the cap protein. But when you add glucose, the cap will be inactive, so you will have even lower expression of LAC ZYA. Now, when you have both lactose and glucose, the lactose is of course imported into the cell because of some basal level expression of LAC ZYA. The repressor is produced as it normally will be, but the LAC Z, which is expressed at basal level, makes allolactose from the lactose, which inactivates the repressor, so it cannot bind the operator anymore. But the catch here is that glucose is also present, so it prevents the cap from being activated through this mechanism that we discussed earlier, which means that the RNA polymerase will initiate transcription without the help of the cap protein. So long story short, there is some mRNA production in this case, which is higher than basal level, but it's not crazy high. So we'll see some increase in the ZYNA proteins in the cell. Now on the other hand, if you take the glucose away and only have the lactose around the bacteria, the basal level expressed permease will of course import the lactose, the repressor is produced, which is as usual, the lac Z is expressed at basal levels, which will make the inducer molecule, which binds the repressor and it inactivates it. So the repressor can no longer bind the operator, which means the RNA polymerase can move along and transcribe some lac ZYA. And now the things get interesting because there is no glucose around, which means that this cyclase enzyme will make CAMP, which means that the CAP will be active. And this active CAP binds the cap binding sequence and positively regulates RNA polymerase, which means more of this lac ZYA mRNA is produced. And this means a lot more of ZYA proteins are made. The Y protein goes and localizes on the cell membrane, which means a lot more lactose is imported as a result. And because you also make more of lac Z, the inducer concentration also starts to increase which means that most all repressor molecules will be inhibited. So there's a strong inactivation of the repressor. And this means that the lac ZYA expression will keep increasing until saturation, until lactose or the inducer runs out. A side note on these proteins. We've talked about Z and Y proteins. But where does lac A fit in? Well, we said in the beginning that it encodes for a transacetylase, which is not required for lac operon itself. But sometimes it is possible that some toxic analogs that look like lactose are also imported into the cell because permease cannot really distinguish between normal galactosides versus toxic galactosides. So the transacetylase encoded by lac A either destroys the toxic analog or it kicks it out of the cell through some independent mechanism. Alright, now I will leave you with a question. When lac operon is active, the lactose is converted into allolactose by the lac Z, but at the same time, it is also converted into galactose and glucose. And as we have said, glucose inactivates the enzyme that makes CAMP, so that means no CRP can be activated, and if CRP is not active, it cannot bind the DNA sequence. So in essence, the glucose produced from the lac operon should induce a negative feedback and bring the lac ZYA expression down in this scenario. But there is no negative feedback. Why do you think that is the case? Think about it and let me know your answers down below in the comments.